Hey listeners, Mallory Wilsey here, chief producer of the Enrollify Network. I get the privilege of working alongside all of our creators at Enrollify, but I wanted to take just a quick moment to tell you about why I love the Talking Tactics podcast hosted by Diana Kibbolds. Every other Tuesday, Day drops a new episode where she focuses on a single tactic that moved the needle on any enrollment metric, from inquiries and booth visitors to apps completed and deposits, even registrations, you name it. The catch? The tactic had to be done with limited resources, either by a single person or a small but mighty team, or limited time, or maybe without a lot of money. The podcast format is fun and engaging, and it's just different from the more traditional 60-minute interview-style shows. If you work in enrollment management or marketing, be sure to give Day's show a listen. You can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Talking Tactics wherever you get your podcasts. The coach in his post-game interview actually said on mic, he thanked his president, he thanked his provost, and he acknowledged that he recognized what this win was going to do for the visibility of not just their basketball program, but for their institution, which is indeed not based in California, but is based in Michigan. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about. Wait! Okay, now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Higher Ed Pulse, your Monday morning energizer covering insights and trends in higher ed marketing and enrollment. I'm Mallory Wilsey, bringing over 15 years of ed tech and marketing expertise to your earbuds. And I'm Seth O'Dell, joining the Pulse with my own adventures from leading marketing at top universities to founding Canahoma, one of the industry's fastest growing digital marketing agencies. Each week, we bring you the kind of insider insights you typically only find over cocktails with your pals at a conference. It's fast, it's fun, and it's designed for you, the busy higher ed professional. You're not just listening to another podcast. You're checking the pulse of higher education. Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher ed professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at Enrollify.org. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at Element451.com. All right, everyone, we're back with the High Red Pulse. I'm Mallory Wilsey, and today I actually have a very special guest joining me in place of Seth O'Dell. He's taking this morning off, but don't worry, he will be back in your earbuds on Thursday. More on that at the end of this episode. But today I have brought in a pinch hitter, Aaron Blue, who is the VP of Education at Primacy. Aaron, why are you here? today. <laughs> yeah, thanks Mallory. It's my favorite time of year. It's March Madness. It's it, it's time to to talk some college basketball and March Madness and I, I previously worked in college athletics for a long time in marketing communications and then flipped over to the institutional side and worked in digital marketing and the crossover between athletics and the academics and the institutional side during March Madness. There's just so many opportunities to be able to kind of elevate your brand and talk about your brand in different ways and draw some more eyeballs to it. So it's my favorite time of year for many reasons with the crossover interest that I have. You know what? It's my favorite time of year too, for a very different reason. We are in the spring awakening of Broadway, and there are like 16 new shows that are hitting New York City this spring and summer. The Tony's buzz is starting. I mean, I know you love basketball, but when we text each other during the week, it's usually Aaron to make TikTok videos. Yeah, that's the that's the inspiration to be able to live up to that Aaron and have that voice when I do karaoke every once in a while would be fantastic. Like, could we just actually do this entire episode about show tunes? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, we could. I mean, you know, there's a tie in between fight songs and Broadway, possibly pep bands and music. Maybe there's a connection there, but. Now, did I hear that you saw a preview of The Great Gatsby? Oh, my gosh, yes. I got the privilege 
of securing a ticket when Great Gatsby was at the Paper Mill Playhouse last year in New Jersey. And man, you know what? I'm just going to give you my hot take. It was just B+. Oh, you're hurting me here. This is like on my bucket list. <laughs> Look, I'm still going to see it when it opens this spring. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm looking forward to seeing the changes. But the book needed some improvement. The music was B plus at best. Like, there just weren't any bangers. Well, hopefully that can change. I still have my eternal optimism on this. So you're, you see, I'm your March Madness insider. You are my Broadway insider. So we'll just keep the connection going. And then you can tell me if it's worth buying a ticket and that when after you see it then. Exactly. And if you make the trip to New York City, I will totally train down and check out that show with you. Actually, circling us back to March Madness, I hear if Caitlin Clark continues her epic run, you may be headed to my neck of the woods in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, being based in Iowa, and, and I actually worked for the, the University of Iowa in the athletic department for 15 some years in media relations, sports information, hence the, the March Madness tie in here. But my last few years was with the women's basketball team, and this was back in 2012, 13, but still know that coaching staff very well and still really close to that team. So being able to watch a transcendent athlete do her thing right in our own backyard here is pretty special. And yeah, Elite Eight and Sweet 16 and Elite Eight, we're already paired in the Albany region. So not many more chances to watch Caitlin play if we're fortunate enough to make it that far. So it's a special thing that she's been able to do. Erin, this is exactly why I wanted to have you on the podcast for today's episode, because your experience is at this really interesting intersection where you have worked for these athletic programs, but now working for Primacy and having the agency perspective, you have so much deeper reach into this industry. And so I would love to kick this conversation off just yeah, because I am admittedly not one that follows a lot of college athletics. So please explain to me why March Madness is such a big deal. And you can explain this to me like I'm a fifth grader, because that actually might be generous for myself and the knowledge that I bring to this conversation. Yeah, it's it's for me, it's, it's the most wonderful time of the year. You know, people say December and holidays are, but when that calendar flips to March and March March Madness has, has taken on this kind of whole aura of itself. And, you know, we're speaking mostly at the Division One men's and women's level here. And we can, you know, talk about Division Two, II, Division Three, and AIA, things like that in a second. But it's the fact that it's teams competing for a national championship, which is always a big deal. It's 68 teams that are either automatically selected from winning their conference tournament or there's a selection committee that gets in. So on selection Sunday, there's this buzz around teams that are on the bubble. Are they going to get in? Are they not going to get in? Are they going to be able to compete, not compete? So there's this this tension with it. And then the fact, too, that there's just starting the Thursday of tournament week, there's basketball on starting at noon Eastern all the way until midnight, you know, playing through the March Madness bracket. Uh, which has become its own thing with bracket pools and contests and everyone wants to fill out a bracket and it might be you're filling it out because you actually know something about college basketball or you're picking it about which mascot you think would win in a fight and you're picking it because you like the certain name of an institution or whatever it might be. But so so that's the the kind of excitement part of it. You're playing for a national championship. It's teams that might not normally play or teams that might have actually played that of renewing rivalries and things like that. But from the brand and exposure perspective, it's on national television, it's streamed everywhere, and it's an opportunity for these institutions to have their brand out in one of the largest sporting events in the country. And you see that through the, you know, the institutional ads that run during games and, you know, for the larger brands that have basketball affiliated with them. It's just kind of a no brainer. But, you know, we can talk about it in a second, too. And there are some of these upsets that happen and what that does for an institutional brand and, and how it ties in. It's just a it's a really interesting intersection, like you mentioned, of the competitive part of basketball and the what it means to compete for a championship. But then what that means for the institutions that are a part of it. So we're recording this on Friday morning. So we have had the benefit of seeing the Thursday night games, although by the time this hits our listeners' earbuds on Monday morning, I'm sure there will have been many more upsets that we could have talked about. But it struck me last night as all five of my brackets broke with Kentucky's loss. I mean, I literally had them going to Final Four in like 
every bracket I put together. Oh, well, that's the beauty of it. I mean, not to, you, you know, much more about Broadway than I do, but I might know a little more about college basketball than you do. And and I had Kentucky going quite a ways too. So it's like, you know, my bracket's pretty broken too. So that's the fun of March Madness too. It's just everyone can participate. Oakland beat Kentucky last night. And, who, you know, who is Oakland? As I'm like watching this game, I'm like, oh, this Californian team. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> right. So even like just your point about the boost in visibility for some of these schools, I think is spot on. And in fact, and I texted you last night when this happened, the coach in his post game interview actually said on mic, he thanked his president, he thanked his provost, and he acknowledged that he recognized what this win was going to do for the visibility of not just their basketball program, but for their institution, which is indeed not based in California, but is based in Michigan. Yeah, there's time and time again, you can look at examples of, you know, what they call the Cinderella stories of, you know, the the lower seeds that pull the upsets. And, you know, you can think back even earlier when, you know, everyone considers Gonzaga a basketball powerhouse now, but there were times where they were the 11, 12 seed in the tournament, making it a run to the uh, lead hate. And then, you know, th those eyeballs and that visibility then goes into where's this place located? Let's look at it. Beautiful campus, great basketball program, great atmosphere. There's been so much data that you can see uh, a, a few years ago when Florida Gulf Coast went on their run. They played such an exciting brand of basketball. They were coined Dunk City because all they did was alley-oops and dunking over people. And it was just an extremely fun style of basketball to play. I remember an, an interview that I think it was their like director of like the, the bookstores on campus said that they had a backlog of like months of orders for T-shirts because everybody wanted Florida Gulf Coast gear and their enrollment went through the roof and applications went through the roof. And you see that with these schools that might not be, you know, on the map per se, you know, at that level. But when something like that happens on a national stage and a national level, you just kind of see I was on Google Trends last night watching the searches for Oakland just skyrocket and the players names and everything that goes with that. It's amazing exposure for a brand and for the institutions that can latch onto it, not from the athletic side, but then also from just the institutional side, whether it's your digital presence, your social presence, there's a fine line of embracing that, which we can talk about too, but just capturing those moments, moments are so important and things like that don't come around very often when you're in that spotlight like that. So being able to capture those in the right way is a great way to, to showcase your institution and who you are. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, this is great for like last night, Oakland or Duquesne, right? These schools like, that had these big upsets and certainly it's boosting some visibility for them. But where's the substance? You know, is this actually going to translate to long-term increase in quality or quantity of applications? Or is this just, you know, their 15 minutes of fame, a bit of a shot in the dark? So you've referenced, you know, some data over the years that maybe points to success for the brand visibility. But what's like what's really happening here when one of these schools gets all this attention? Yeah, I think there's two kind of different routes of it. And one is the schools that might not get the national attention usually that kind of get into the spotlight and, and capitalizing on that 15 minutes of fame. And then there are schools that have a, you know, a larger athletic presence looking at kind of like the basketball blue bloods and, and places like that. But then for some of those institutions on that side to start first. I think there's always this hesitancy, you know, when, when we talk, um, you know, to, to schools that have large athletic programs, there's always kind of the stereotypes around athletics, right? You know, football, tailgating, partying, party school, you know, athletics is, are they really taking, is it the student athlete really the thing in today's environment now with, you know, name and image and likeness and the transfer portal and all this college athletics is in a tough spot. But if you look at how people and alumni and people relate to an institution, you know, they don't say I'm a University of Iowa student, whatever they say, I'm a Hawkeye or, you know, I'm a Jayhawk or I'm a, you know, whatever it might be. And there's that instant connection there. And that's how people relate to the institution. So for institutions to be able to use their channels outside of athletics, to be able to find that happy medium of capitalizing on athletic content, but then tying it back into what the institution does 
for students. And it might be a student athlete that's a, a 4.0 that's at the College of Business. Well, why is the College of Business so great? You know, and tying it in there and, and telling those stories that way. But then for the institutions that are getting those 15 minutes of fame, you know, in, in the Cinderella side of things, leaning into it even heavier, because like I, like I said last night, the, the Google trend search stuff for Oakland and Duquesne was through the roof. So people are going to the institutional homepage. They're they're looking for that. They're looking for content. So capitalize on it. Does it have to be game recaps and highlight videos and everything like that? No, but it needs to be something about recognizing, hey, we're in this moment and here are some things that are really good about the institution that you may not know and play that up a little bit um, because that's when students might go, oh, that was a really fun basketball team to watch. I really like that coach. Oh, and they have the major that I'm looking for. And then I could go watch this team or I could go be in this campus environment or things like that. And athletic content really does drive engagement. You know, I manage social media accounts, you know, on both the athletic side and the institutional side for years. And on the institutional side, I always joked that if we were hurting for engagement, if I posted something about the weather, about dogs or about athletics, it was just like the free engagement posts. So there's something there at the core of an institution with athletics that I feel like some institutions are afraid to tap into because of the stereotypes that go with it. But there's a, a fine balance that you can strike that really does boost the overall brand. Hey, everyone, it's Mallory. I'm hosting the Engage Summit this summer in Raleigh, North Carolina. The theme of the conference is AI Got You. We're not just talking theories. This conference is your guide to understanding and applying AI at your institution. By the end, you won't just get AI. You'll be ready to lead your campus through an AI transformation. It's for everyone who wants to use AI to level up everything you're doing. Whether your focus is to recruit or retain, the Summit offers a platform to learn, network, and bring back actionable insights to enhance your student engagement strategies. I hope you'll join me and some of your favorite Enrollify creators in Raleigh on June 25th and 26th, like Jamie Hunt, Dustin Ramsdale, and Allison Tercio. Use the discount code Enrollify50, and you can register for just $99. So join us at the Engage Summit this June. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. We can't wait to see you there. So for an institution where athletics is a smaller part of the overall campus culture, you know, where is the tie-in to this season? You know, people are filling out brackets all over that don't know anything about basketball. And I've always said, even for institutions that might not have strong athletic programs or, you know, aren't at the Division I level, there's a way to capitalize on the momentum that March brings. And some of it ties into what we hear from prospective students all the time. They want to see outcome stories, right? So they want to know if I go to this institution, am I going to get in the career that I want to? Am I going to have this outcome that I want? So finding those tie-ins with March Madness with alums that you have is a great idea. Is it, did someone go to your school that's now an announcer for CBS or ESPN or is behind the scenes as a producer or is, are doing those types of things? You know, that that's a great way to tie in the relevancy of March Madness with your institution. You know, I, I talked about it earlier too. People love filling out brackets. So at your school, your most famous alumni do a bracket, have alumni and audiences vote on it. Favorite places on campus, favorite profet, you know, all these types of tie-ins where it, you can have a March Madnessy feel or have a connection into it. You don't have to be one of the 68 teams selected on the men's or women's side, or you don't even have to be even at the division two, II, division three NAIA level. You don't have to be in that tournament to be to take part in it. There's just there's something about March Madness that people enjoy and being able to make those little connections with your institution, even if it's with an outcome or with, you know, some sort of social activity, digital activity, things like that. It's a way to show that you're paying attention to what's happening. You know, I follow so many Broadway Instagram accounts. And one of my favorite ones right now is actually doing a Broadway show bracket, essentially. And eventually, they're going to land on what they'll call the, you know, the best Broadway show of all time. So if they can do it, <laughs> so can we. What's your vote? What's your where what's going to land? 
that's the hardest question I will ever be asked on this podcast. I can guarantee it. I mean, it kind of depends on the day and what I've seen recently. So we've been talking a lot about all of this positive momentum that visibility from March Madness can bring to an institution. But I was reading Inside Higher Ed this week and actually found a really interesting article about some of the financial struggles that are happening with college athletics, especially coming out of the pandemic and how it seems like there is a talk of cutting programs at a number of these D1 institutions. Very interesting, though, in the article, and we'll link to this in the show notes for folks, but it was juxtaposing these D1 cuts up against Division two and three institutions, which are indicating that athletics continues to be a driver for interest and enrollment. What's your take on that, Aaron? I saw that article too. And it's just a really interesting time in college athletics now across divisions and across sizes, whether it, like we said, D1 all the way down to community colleges and NAIA and, you know, division two, division three, everything. There were a lot of larger institutions, you know, larger division one institutions and power five conferences during COVID that obviously you couldn't host any games. So ticket revenue is 60, 70, 80, 90% of revenue for major college athletics, especially on the football and basketball side. So when that revenue was taken away, the departments were hurting, you know, some that were completely self-sufficient that never took a dime of either state money for a state institution or, you know, took money from the institutional side and just kind of kept everything, you know, funded from athletics, you know, had to take money from other sources. And, you know, now that's needing to be paid back or whatever that might be. So that's a real struggle on that side as cost for major division one. The rise of college athletics and the funding behind it, the costs are rising with name, image and likeness and players being paid and just the race for the best facilities for recruiting and everything like that. So the the budget cuts are real, but we've been fortunate enough at Primacy to work with a lot of great private institutions, smaller institutions, you know, maybe places like your alma mater that were at the D2, D3 level. And when we're going in and working on a branding project or a website redesign or things like that, you know, we talk about the student persona and what makes that up. And there's always a focus on the student athlete. And the student athlete at those institutions are ones that are coming in. They realize that they're probably not going to go play professional sports somewhere, but it's a chance to continue a passion that they had and continue in that area. And that's where the recruitment side of it is really important for them to be able to say, hey, we have these programs. You have a chance to come here and still continue your sport. To, if you want to be a coach, you're getting that experience. You know, you're doing those types of things. And, you know, I'd, I'd argue that some of those experiences are more valuable and what the Division One experiences used to be like. Division One has just become this massive, just this massive uh, money making <laughs> financial scenario with conference realignment. You look at the money that some of these schools are getting from, you know, leaving the Pac-12 to join the Big Ten and what these TV rights deals have, you know, a B with billions in front of it and what this money, you know, where this funding is coming from. At those smaller schools, the student athletes there for the experience. And, you know, I would argue, too, that the students that aren't athletes are there for the experience as well. And maybe not, you know, to attend a bunch of games or, you know, be in the student section and, you know, all those types of things. But there's that camaraderie aspect of being on a smaller campus and being a part of that and being able to interact and see those types of things. And it's part of it's part of that brand. And the next three to five years, I think, in higher education in general is going to be utterly fascinating. But in the college athletics world, I think it's just going to be it's the Wild West now, and it's going to be even wilder in the next few years. Well, if institutions start cutting programs, doesn't that have some Title IX implications too? Yeah, it's a really difficult, it's a difficult conversation to have when you're looking at programs being cut because, you know, with Title IX and making sure that there's equity and balance, if programs are cut, there needs to be, you know, equal opportunities, and that's based on roster spots and, and things like that. So, you know, you've seen it across the country at the division one level. There's been a lot of, you know, men's gymnastics and wrestling, especially were hit pretty hard, you know, in the last decade or so with budget cuts. But the other thing too would is, you know, we always talk about the facilities races and, you know, on a previous episode of this podcast or where you talked about it, I should say where it was, you know, 
buying old buildings so you didn't have to renovate them and you know going from that side and the the shift to online education and everything that happens off of a campus there's such a tie-in with athletics and being on a campus and it's school spirit and campus and going to events and things like that but how institutions are able to make online students still feel a part of that experience and still feel a part of the not even the fan base but just the just the experience base of that it's it's going to be critical because that's a tie into feeling loyal to where you're getting your degree and what it feels like. And then that transitions into if you need to go back and get a second degree or you're going back to change careers or a micro credential or whatever it has happened, you know, wherever that happens, it's going to be really important to to be able to tie that in and the title line side of it, too, to, to kind of put a pin on that, how that will start to affect athletic programs and and what programs are able to stay in the race and which ones might be kind of fading a little bit because of of budget concerns is going to be a completely different world in the next three to five years of of what college athletics actually offers and looks like. Well, Aaron, it was just such a treat to have you on the podcast to talk about a topic that you are clearly so passionate about, so knowledgeable about. I appreciate all of your insights. And folks, maybe this is your sign to go have fun with this March Madness stuff. Find that tie in to your brand. And this is one of those things, like you said, that you can post about weather, dogs, and sports, and pretty much be guaranteed to get some engagement. So, some low hanging fruit here for our listeners for sure. Now, folks, do not worry. Seth O'Dell will be back in your earbuds as the guest of this Thursday's Pulse Check episode. Our current series is on mergers and acquisitions, and Seth sits down with host Kin Sejpal to examine how marketing leaders should establish their voice and know what to bring to an M&A process, both on the acquiring and the acquired sides. It is a do not miss episode because they're going to dig into how to leverage marketing data to develop a sound transition strategy, which is not something that I often hear discussed. So it's an insightful episode. I know everyone will enjoy it. If you are subscribed to this podcast on Apple or Spotify, it will hit your feed Thursday morning. Aaron, where can people find you if they want to stay connected? Yeah, thanks. Find me on LinkedIn, Aaron Blue, B-L-A-U, and always, always willing to have conversations and discussions over comment threads in LinkedIn and also, you know, uh, through our website at theprimacy.com to check out the work that we're doing in higher education and some of our our thoughts and blogs, things like that about everything higher education related. So I feel honored to be on this podcast. You guys have done such a great job. And like I said, we travel to a lot of different campuses and, and talk resources and things like that. And we've heard admissions directors, marketing directors, everything. Have you guys heard the pulse? Have you heard you know, the stuff on Enrollify? So reaching out and being able to be on here was uh, was an honor. I feel privileged. So thank you very much, Mallory. Amazing. Well, we always love to hear that feedback. And with that, folks, we'll see you next time. The Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. And we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our show helps higher ed marketers and admission pros find their next big idea and features a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Brian Gross, Eddie Francis, Jenny Lee Fowler, and so many of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.